Hi everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our first webcast in the Make Your, Count, Make Your Work Count series. I'm your moderator, Nicole, and uh, we'll be starting today's webcast, Securing Your Most Valuable Asset, Information Momentarily. In the meantime, uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes here. So we have the audio portion of the platform on mute so as to minimize any disruption on the line for our audience today. But we welcome your questions. Uh, if you have any questions for our presenter, Mark, please go ahead and click the blue chat icon in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. And as we work through the material today, you can enter your questions in that space. Uh, I'll be monitoring the chat window, and Mark will be answering your questions at the end of the webcast. So without further ado, I think we're just a couple minutes past one here. I wanted to let the last few people uh, in our digital lobby join into the live webcast. So it looks like we're all set and ready to go here. Thanks everyone for joining us today. And without further delay, I'll pass you over to Mark Cote, our presenter for today. Thanks, Nicole. And uh, uh, thanks for everyone for attending today's webcast. Like Nicole said, this is the uh, first in the Make Your Work series, Make Your Work Count series for RICO Canada, a series which runs until the end of June. I'm your presenter. My name is Mark Cody. So I am the VP Legal and General Counsel for RICO Canada. Just to give you a quick uh, bit of information about me, I've been uh, with RICO Canada since 2010. Prior to that, I was um, Legal Counsel in the consumer electronics business with uh, Sony Electronics. And uh, before, uh, before that, in the early 2000s, I, uh, I started my career at a couple of law firms in Toronto, Baker and & McKenzie, and Fraser and & Beattie, uh, which is now Denton's. So the topic today that, we, uh, that we're presenting on is one which seems to get more and more important every day as our digital world evolves, the topic being information security. My hope is that this presentation is going to spark some curiosity on your part. Maybe it will lead you to ask what, what I could do better in my organization um, or uh, what, what additional steps we could potentially take in my organization. So if that's the case, then we'll have achieved our objective. I'm just having a delay here to move the slides ahead. So let's get on to the, the agenda. just want to go over the agenda quickly uh, with you. So as I mentioned, the topics information security, uh, including cybersecurity. We're going to co cover the topics from a couple of diff different angles, as you can see from the agenda. I'm going to start with some basic definitions, as well as some current and timely examples of security breaches that have occurred in real life. That's going to get your attention, I think. A lot of these are, are, uh, are uh, events that you already know about, but we'll discuss them in just briefly. We'll talk about then the responsibilities and duties uh, of a business when dealing with information security and some perspectives on managing ongoing risk. I, I want to um, emphasize that I'll, I'll be looking to get some insight into information security through the lens of print management, print business being obviously one of the sweet spots of uh, RICO's business, our traditional strengths. So it's natural for us to identify risks, management of risks from the perspective of print security. But I just want to mention I am uh, Rico's lawyer. I'm not a product marketer, so my objective isn't really to get into uh, our products in detail. I'm really looking to use the references to our products as, um, in order to highlight that print security is one element. It's one element among many that a business or an organization has to deal with in, in its ongoing management of information security in its organization.
Let's start with some um, sobering, sobering um, statistics. You know, it wasn't too long ago that information security really meant losing paper files. Um, I started my career, like I said, in the early 2000s in uh, law firms. At that time, uh, I, I have to say, I remember the being kind of awestruck at the overflowing file cabinets. My impression was always that the um, that the most effective deterrent to getting access to the sensitive data in the firm was the fact that you could probably never find anything in that mass of paper. Of course, that was my perspective then coming into uh, an industry which is very, very paper-centric, very information-heavy. Um, now, we've moved from, in most cases, um, a heavy emphasis on paper to obviously the transition to a digital, uh, digital uh, workplace. Now I work in an office, um, either from an office or remote. Uh, I have um, almost no physical paper storage. I can't remember, even though I'm a lawyer, I can't remember the last time I truly opened a paper file on an ongoing ordinary course of business activity. Obviously files are important for certain things like litigation, but a lot of um, a lot of ordinary course matters just don't get paper files. So as we as we contemplate the evolution of uh, the digital workplace, the digital world, let's think about these statistics. Look at the statistics here. Forty percent of businesses believe that they are unlikely to be a target for cybercrime. That comes from um, research uh, from Aviva. There was a Global Information Security Survey by Ernst & Young in 2015. Uh, and that's where the second statistic comes in. Almost 35% of Canadian organizations do not believe that they can detect a sophisticated cybersecurity attack. And then we have the, the, the other information about what's a, what is a, what's a patient record worth? What is a... Uh, what is a credit card information? What is credit card information worth on the black market? Um, the 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 value seems very low, but of course the impact on the individual is huge and can last for years. Just want to jump into some definition. What what is? I'm advancing the slides here. It's giving me some delay. Sorry. What is information security? So we, we want to think about information security as well as cybersecurity and to think about the kind of subtle differences. So information security being process and methodology designed to protect print, electronic, or other forms of confidential or private information from unauthorized access. Cybersecurity, processes and practices to protect systems and data from unauthorized access electronically. And then you know, data breach, uh, unauthorized access. So um, just wanted to kind of cover those, cover those baselines. Then we get to, you know, obviously speaking as a lawyer, what's the legislation that applies? What's the legislation that applies to the collection, storage, and deletion of uh, sensitive data? If you look, I'm just getting to the slide here, but you, if you look at, at the list that I will have on my slide, the list is long, and it's surprisingly complex. It starts with the it starts with federal legislation, the Privacy Act governing the governing uh, public institutions, the PEDA, 
we can't forget that PIPETA will be amended over time, one of the amendments being the Digital Privacy Act. Then we've got the second layer, the provincial layer, which is Quebec, Alberta, BC, who have their own provincial uh, statutes. We have specific statutes relating to health information in health information in Ontario, New Brunswick, Newfoundland. There's always sector specific, like the Bank Act and the Insurance Act, and then we can't forget, we can't forget the fact that foreign legislation may also apply. So most recently, there was a, um, there is a, uh, the General Data Protection Regulation, which some of you may have heard of, adopted in 2016 in the European Union and will start to apply beginning in May of 2018. Quite frankly, in our own business today, we are discussing the potential impact of that, uh, those additional rules uh, as they apply to us. We can't, we, we all, so, so the, the, the landscape is wide and the landscape is constantly changing in terms of your um, legal obligations. I'm going to go into now some um, information breaches in real life, and uh, apologies, the slide kind of advanced a little bit more than I expected here. So information breaches. These are the anecdotes that we have already heard about in the news. Let's think of probably one that you've all heard of, the Ashley Madison case. Um, this incident and the fallout from the incident is very important. There were so many related issues that the event represents an almost perfect storm. So if we think about the, the background of the Ashley Madison uh, incident, uh, this is a commercial website dedicated to users who are married but want to engage in extramarital affairs. The, the website specifically billed itself as shrouding its users um, from uh, shrouding them in a, a secure platform that would guarantee anonymity. In 2015, a group uh, was called the Impact Team hacked into Ashley Madison's system, leaked 25 gigs of company data, including personal information. What was the what was the fallout? The ini the initial fallout. The CEO had to leave the company. Class action lawsuit, $500 million. Um, several suicides were attributed to the security breach. When it comes to the statements by privacy commissioners, these are very instructive. There were four different kind of contraventions that were, uh, that were pointed to by privacy commissioners. So failure to protect, failure to destroy information, failure to ensure accuracy of personal information, and lack of transparency with users. The the main thrust of the, the statements by privacy commissioners was that you can't use your terms of service to absolve yourself of your legal obligations. As, as a very specific example coming out of Ashley Madison, Ashley Madison actually charged their users a fee, a fee to delete their information. But even if you paid the fee, they didn't delete the information for 12 months. So all of that going to the fact that it's not just what you say in your terms and conditions, it's what you actually do in your business. 
go to the next um, go to the next example of the Home Depot. In September 2014, the Home Depot revealed that 56 million customer credit card and customer debit card numbers were stolen. Um, the the uh, the cyber thieves had um, infected POS systems in stores across North America, and uh, so you know what's the what's the fallout? Huge huge cost to Home Depot, sixty two million dollars um, or more, largest theft ever of credit card information. If we go to another one, Sony. Sony, again, a hugely expensive um, breach. April 2011, their PlayStation Network and online entertainment suffered a, um, suffered a, um, a breach and 100 terabytes of information was stolen. The cost of this has been estimated at a, over $170 million U.S. These are huge. Obviously, these are huge companies. Obviously, huge amounts of information. Um, that's, and as well, because, because it's been so huge, the, um, the information gets in the newspaper. Um, the um, uh, th that's that's not to say that smaller uh, organizations can't also suffer. The uh, the last example, Yahoo Mail. So, in uh, in uh, August of 2013, one billion user amounts were compromised. Largest ever cybersecurity breach in history. Quite frankly, this event was in addition to a second security breach, which occurred in 2014, but was announced by Yahoo in advance of, of this one. Um, what's been the, the fallout? It's not over yet. Huge reputational damage to Yahoo, um, and as well, in March 2017, the U.S. announced, um, sorry, that should say charges, against two Russian intelligence officers and two hackers. So. When you think about um, the, uh, the, these elements, these events, the, uh, there, is a, there is a vast field of, um, of crimes or breaches that can occur with data. The RCMP classifies cybercrime into two fields, one being technology as instrument, the other is technology as target. So you could have either a mass marketing Fraud, which would be using technology as an instrument to obtain uh, to uh, obtain others' information, or you could have technology as a target, um, where you've got either hacking, um, uh, denial of service, malware threats, etc. So a a, a a a wide field and a wide um, a wide uh, risk. Uh, risk to, to businesses. Uh, I just want to mention, as I mentioned before, PIPEDA and other privacy legislations are being uh, amended over time. So, uh, one of the most important privacy bulletins that have come out recently, so this dates back to 2015, is the, uh, the interpretation bulletin that, um, that aligns with the enactment of the Digital Privacy Act. What does the Digital Privacy Act do? It establishes, it, it seeks to establish more objective, um, more objective standards for getting consents from individuals. It also imposes greater, greater obligations of notice, reporting, and record keeping. And this, this shouldn't be, shouldn't be the, the last amendment that we should expect from, uh, from the federal government to, to PETA. We think about the standard of care that a company um, must, uh, must maintain when it comes to keeping its information. So we have the legislative standards of care under the various statutes. Um, we also have the additional layers 
when we deal with special information like healthcare information. Um, some information like healthcare and personal financial information is considered obviously highly sensitive because it's highly important to individuals. Nobody would care about hacks if it didn't actually get them truly valuable information. So as the sensitivity of the information increases, the standard of care also increases. So um, I want to mention, uh, you know, we've gone to the slide where we remind ourselves that a company that collects data, a company or an organization, right, not-for-profits, companies, um, uh, other agencies, if you collect data, you are responsible for all the personal information in your custody or under your control. Don't forget your board of directors. Don't forget your board of directors. Um, there is a, obviously a standard of care of, uh, of a director to exercise care, skill, and diligence. And, um, and we have to remember that, that uh, that's highly important. We've gotten to reputational risk. This is huge. This is huge. Um, reputational risk is aligned absolutely uh, front and center with security. Uh, security issues. The, uh, there was a global survey and report from uh, Deloitte & Touche um, that, that, uh, that remind us of these statistics. So loss of revenue was the most significant consequence in 41% of cases. Loss of brand value, again, over 40%. And regulatory investigation, top of the list in respect of these companies uh, in terms of their, um, uh, the, their expected ramifications. So data security, security of, of, uh, of personal information, sensitive information is, is highly, highly important. Um, let's jump into, let's jump into, um, let's jump into the, the uh, Rico's traditional business of, of printing. If you think of printing uh, that we have a special expertise in, uh, as we say here, there's still a loophole. MFDs, so uh, multifunction devices, they provide what's, what's referred to here as anonymous information off-ramps to the outside world. So what is, a, what is a printer? A printer is an endpoint in your network. It's an example of the interface between your, the information in your network and the real world. Are you thinking about your printing? Are you also thinking about any other endpoints in your network? So let's think about managing risk. Um, and if we just jump to the next slide, Nicole. Um, co corporate audit and risk committees or management, company management really has to focus on the connection between cybersecurity, information security, and the financial well-being of the organization. I have to think about implementing risk mitigation plans for responding to a breach. If we think about the various steps, and of course this is kind of like a spiral, you think about developing a strategy does your strategy include, you know, when we think about our example, does your strategy include print? Um, you have to perform an assessment. You have to, you need to, um, you need to identify your critical systems in order for you to prioritize the the most important elements of your um, of your security network. Um, you have to not just identify. You have, to t you have to tag investment against it, and you also have to implement. Uh, you have to implement in an effective way uh, in order to truly address the, uh, your security concerns. And then you have to continually review and improve. So then you, then you kind of go back to the beginning of the list and you go back to your, your, uh, your strategy. So it's kind of like a spiral, like I said, uh, when you think about managing, managing risk. In this, uh, in this context. You know, jumping back into uh, our, our RICO's kind of key area, print management, print security. Uh, Nicole, if we can go to the next slide. 
let's, let's pull up a screen on statistics about, about print management. You know, quite frankly, I just want to highlight a couple of statistics that really jumped out at me. Uh, if you look at the, the, uh, the one on the left, one out of six companies, only one out of six companies have a str strategy for print security. And then if you look at the top, top uh, left and right, so not only have 70% of companies experienced a data breach through printing, but also 40% have experienced more than one security breach through printing. That is, that's a surprise. It's a reminder that um, printing, just like with any of your other network endpoints, reveals that there are, um, there are dangers in the, uh, inside an organization. Issues can arise not just through errors, but through actions from, from individuals in the, inside an organization. I just want to mention while we stay on this slide, um, a, uh, a recent um, class action suit against uh, Bank of Nova Scotia. It's called Evans in Nova Scotia. Uh, the, uh, the class action plaintiff sued the, the, um, the bank and the employee for breach of privacy because of the employees providing of private information to third parties due to fraud. This class action did, did get certification, and in May 2016, the bank proposed a settlement. $1.155 million proposed settlement by the bank. Huge, huge value. So, just want to mention that, wanted to mention that. If we think about the four, uh, four layers to print security, and you can use this against other network endpoints, we think about device security, we think about network security, we think about content security, and we think about auditing and tracking capability. So when we think about device authentication, things like print release, Workflows, using network credentials. If, if you allow an unauthorized personnel access to function, uh, um, access to print devices, that is just as dangerous as providing unrestricted access to personal computers within your network, mobile devices attaching to your network. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission uh, wrote in a uh, report called Copier Data Security Guide for Business, they said digital copiers are computers. The report stated that organization should, and organizations should incorporate these devices into their information security plans. If we think about addressing your device security, if you establish authentication at a device, if we think about the device as a computer, we then identify the user. We allow the user access or we deny access to the capabilities of the device. Authentication enables auditing, reporting, and tracking. If you can't get authentication, you can't audit, which puts you back to square one. You simply have people with unauthorized access potentially gaining direct access to your network and your information. If we think about network security, Network security, of course, is a broad, broad term, right? We're not just talking about uh, endpoints. Those are, it is the policies and practices that we use to prevent and monitor access, misuse, modification, denial of a network or network resources or tools. If you, if you establish um, software solutions that give you a layer of information security, 
beyond what's normally attaching to the device, normally attaching to the print device, for example, you can then establish appropriate security protocols and you, you can override, again, the, the, the vulnerability that an unauthorized uh, access to a device um, represents. If we go to the next slide, Nicole, when you authenticate against a, an Active Directory, it allows access to uh, uh, predefined repositories. So um, that way, we know that files, servers, uh, sorry, files, documents are securely distributed to the right places and people. In addition, you, if, you, if you think about uh, encryption, encryption allows you to transmit documents securely. Encryption is, is, uh, is now the industry standard where it, uh, where it wasn't previously. If we go to content security, why is, why is um, content security important? Content security is the heart of data security. There is a huge amount of content generated. There's, um, there, there are more than 1 billion Microsoft Office users worldwide generating half a trillion documents annually. That's 500 documents per person per year across the world. And that simply, uh, it, it's staggering how much, uh, how much volume that is and it highlights the, the increasing requirement for content security. Documents are essentially the primary vehicle for, uh, for sharing information with other people. If we think about you know, a, a primary way to, uh, to manage content security, uh, we can think about workflow automation. Uh, uh, if you have an automated content filtering system, the so you can have software that reviews each print, fax, or scan job and searches for predefined confidential information. If the information is not found, the, the document proceeds. If predefined information is found, the job is intercepted and segregated. That, that represents a, um, uh, a true step uh, towards uh, uh, getting greater content, uh, content security. Again, I, I, I don't want to get too deep into, uh, too deep into specific uh, product, uh, product capabilities, but these are, these are, I'm trying to hit these on a kind of a high level. Finally, we've got track audit report. You think about, uh, if you think about um, audit trails, why is an audit trail important? Obviously, like we talked before about device security, if you want to, be com if you want to achieve compliance with your obligations, whether, you know, whether they're your general legal obligations or the, the, the objectives of your organization, um, you have to be able to monitor how devices are being used. The way one, one, the way organizations uh, monitor computer use today, uh, it allows you to see if devices are being used in an inappropriate manner. You're able to identify the users. You're able to use that information to take um, take action. Going to the next side, activity tra uh, tracking. So just to to keep in mind, activity monitoring gives you an audit trail from uh, your network endpoint, in this case, your print and capture products, for all documents that are processed on that network endpoint. This allows you to 
track and secure your print activity. And you can also think about using this for cost savings in your in your network. But um, that's not really the the focus of our uh, of our presentation today. We're thinking here about, you know, as we say, dollars and cents. If we think back to reputational risk and the dollars that I have uh, kind of thrown out there in this in the presentation, you know, the impact on a company's reputation includes loss of revenues based on customers leaving reduced transaction volumes. There's a direct relationship between reputational impact and the publication of a security breach. I mean, all the examples that we mentioned earlier are, are reflections of this. Um, there are some estimates in the industry that reputational damage accounts for between 5% and 20% of the total cost of a cybersecurity breach. So, you know, you think about these mechanisms, and the, the, the mechanisms that are up on the screen are, uh, you know, product-based, but these, uh, these are security measures to, that seek to control the, uh, that ensure the confidentiality of information and seek to control access to secure information and the flow of that information through your, uh, through your business. Um, I want to mention, just in passing, this notion of you know cost, cost reduction, or cost transparency. A, if you craft and get the buy-in of your organization on a security management strategy, in our case, you know we always talk about print management strategy. And if you're able to get buy-in of the organization, you can mitigate risk, but you can also um, you can also speak internally in your organization about the overall long-term savings. It is difficult when it comes to compliance activities to, because they're often characterized as a pure expense until something hits the fan. So. Um, in some cases, in our business, for example, there are spin-off benefits to companies in terms of ROI when, when implementing um, security features. So that's something that we tend, to, uh, we tend to highlight because that's one way to widen, broaden the discussion within organizations in terms of what's the, what is the um, what's the total cost to the organization, and what's the total benefit of implementing these, um, these, uh, these uh, uh, strategies and actions. The key is, going back to the, going to the next slide, if we don't have a security strategy, we have some real, real dangers. And then that's where your costs really, really uh, uh, arise. If ever one were to have a claim, no enforcement of organizational data policies, for example, no visibility or control over document activities, increased risk of information loss or breach. So all of that tells you that one of the primary goals of compliance is, um, is to minimize risk of claims, also to minimize the risk of reputational harm. So overall, there is always a return on investment in, in uh, investment in your uh, security. But it's, um, it's, a, it's a discussion that has to be broad and, um, and has to really be uh, informed by the, the, the context of, the, uh, of, of your business and of, uh, and of the, the sector that, you, that you're working in. Uh, Nicole, if we can move forward to the, to the last, um, last element here. I want to call out how much is enough. How much, how much security is enough? And this always depends on 
the organization, depends on your industry, depends on your, your threats. If we think about when do we have enough, we can answer that unequivocally. We never have enough. We'll never be in a place in any organization, including my own, where we have enough security. Because in the end, information security is always a process. It's not a state. It's not an end state. It's a, uh, it's a process that we have to continue going through as the world evolves. And as you evolve your own strategies and your, um, your uh, mitigation, uh, uh, mitigation strategies and, uh, and actions, you want to always think about engaging your whole team. Uh, the security is a compliance function, yes, or, or you know, when we speak of it in a narrow sense, compliance with legislation. But it really is something that has to be looked at holistically. Uh, if, if any uh, risk management strategy or uh, risk management tactics, if they are ever to be successful, you need buy-in from across the organization. That's why you always want to think about making sure that your compliance team is, includes a mix of members from your business units. You need your senior management, you need your subject matter experts in IT, you need your legal folks, you need your internal audit function if it exists. If it exists, that's always a good way. And, um, and sometimes you need your history too to be brought to the table. If you've been burned, then that is immensely valuable in your, in your, uh, in your organization. So that's the end of my, uh, that's the end of my, uh, my main presentation. Curious if there are uh, questions, we can go through those and, um, and, then, um, and then see. Uh, see what we so thank you very much, Mark. It's Nicole on the line with all of you again as your moderator. I've been keeping track of some questions here that you guys have been great about submitting questions through uh, the chat window in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. So I do have a small handful of questions for you here, Mark. To the audience, yep. if you have any other questions whilst we're working through uh, the ones in hand, by all means, go ahead and enter those into the chat window. As I said, in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a blue chat icon. Just click on there and enter your questions in the uh, chat window. So let's see, Mark. The, actually, I'll field the, uh, the first one, if you like. A couple of our audience members were inquiring as to whether the slides would be uh, available to them or circulated or emailed to them after the webcast. The answer, everybody, is uh, absolutely yes. So we are in the process of having the entire deck as well translated to French. And we will be posting uh, both the French and the English versions of the deck online for you to access. You'll receive an email from RICO Canada, uh, and it will send you just the, the direct link to be able to um, access the slides online. So thank you for your questions. The next question, um, I think I'll go ahead and field one more for the group before I pass over uh, two questions to Mark. They're more legal-centric. The first one was from uh, our audience member, Cindy. She was inquiring as to what we recommend to do when upgrading to a new uh, MFD. With the, what should they do with the old photocopier? So is there any data that may still be stored on the old copier? And it's a great question, Cindy, and we've seen um, a huge evolution in the technology of the devices and in turn what we're able to do to ensure that we lock down your information and make it as inaccessible uh, to any nefarious folks with evil crafted ideas. One thing that you can do, and I, I can't say whether all hardware manufacturers um, pursue this type of offering or not, but I can say that in my limited familiarity with the hardware side of the Rico Canada business, there's such a thing as a removable hard disk drive. So that HDD, that hard disk drive that's in your MFD, that can be removed. 
and RICO can return that to you or destroy it on your behalf. And I know we have a number of customers um, within, for instance, within the Canadian government where there's extremely high uh, security measures that need to be taken, and that's something that we're able to offer to them in particular, for example, or other customers in the financial uh, sector. So that's definitely something that you should talk about with your solution consultants with whatever manufacturer you're working with, but certainly your, uh, your sales reps and your solution consultants from the RICO Canada side can absolutely help you with, that, uh, with those measures. So thank you for your question, Cindy. We have another question here. Um, this one's from Mal. So Mark, the question to you is, does your organization have a mitigation plan in respect of compliance with the Patriot Act in the USA? Okay, that's a really interesting. Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting question because there's been kind of a lot of talk about um, about the Patriot Act. Um, just for anybody who's not familiar, the Patriot Act was um, was enacted in the United States after 9/11 um, in order to establish more powers by uh, Homeland Security and related agencies to um, access information and access information specifically that was in the United States. So when it comes to, uh, so that created a bit of a furor at the time because, um, because people were concerned about you know, suddenly having uh, huge access by, um, by the Bush, admi Bush administration <coughs> of, their, of their personal data. So. Um, I just wanted to address this because, in fact, the Patriot Act is a little bit of a, a little bit of a red herring. Um, Patriot Act is a um, is um, provides powers to U.S. agencies, but uh, let's face it: if, in fact, uh, CSIS or another uh, or the RCMP were to be um, working in conjunction with U.S. law enforcement. They would be um, they'd be able to access information in Canada and then share it with the U.S. So, so really, a mitigation plan in connection with the Patriot Act is um, less important to us as an organization than compliance with specific uh, industry or uh, other legislation that would require, for example, information to maintain in, to be maintained in Canada, uh, for example, under the Insurance Act. So that's, um, that's, I hope that answered the question. Thanks, Mark. There's a question here from um, Cindy. In regards to photocopiers, what does RICO recommend to help reduce any security risks? So that's obviously a pretty broad question. Um, the hardware itself has a number of different um, authentication protocols that you can leverage. And absolutely, the types of things that Mark was speaking here today about, uh, these were all software-centric, things that you can do to really lock down the security of your information, not only internally, not only from the perspective of locking down your MFD, for instance, your multifunction device, and who has access to that particular you know, hardware on-ramp and off-ramp device, but as well, Mark said, uh, particularly I, re I remembered something that jumped out at me, that he said, as your information moves throughout your organization and leaves your organization. So the types of things you'll recall that Mark had spoken about were things like uh, print management strategies. So how do print jobs come off of your MFD? If you have any print job that comes off your MFD and is sitting in the tray and it has any kind of personal information, that is a security risk. So software can, for instance, lock down that MFD so that no print jobs are able to come off of the MFD until the originator of the print job walks up to the MFD and, for instance, with a proximity card or a prox card uh, can open that device thereby authenticating the, the originator of the print and enabling them to pick up their print job. That way nothing's left behind. Has the added benefit of, of improving your green uh, initiatives so you're not wasting a ton of paper and lining the blue bin each night. 
you're saving additional money in terms of orphaned print jobs and reducing the amount of things that go uh, directly into the blue bin. So that's just a way, one way at the MFD that a, that a user can ensure there's more security around their print jobs or confidential information. Mark talked about a couple of workflow-centric things that can be done. So for instance, uh, jobs that go through your, your environment or if they are headed to an external email address, for instance, or an off-site doc digital document storage facility, then that document can be scanned, can be read by a piece of software, and that software then can be pre-informed to make intelligent decisions based on the content it reads in your particular document. So if, say, you have a document that uh, has the letters SIN for social insurance number, so you could have uh, you know, that document be flagged as it's going through the system. It could be held back if that's what makes sense for your organization. You could have the software automatically redact that information, so remove the actual text from the document and backfill that space with a black bar to indicate that there was confidential information there. So these kinds of things, when it comes to this type of software, are super flexible insofar as they are implemented in an organization to the means that makes the most sense for the way you need to work, which is kind of speaks to our, our overarching um, objective here, which is make your work count. So there's a lot of different things that you can do to take what you know, back in the day used to be just a photocopier. Now that photocopier has evolved to being a real hub of information, not just for making photocopies and prints, but it can also access cloud-based applications for storage or collaboration. So there's a lot that you can do today to be able to augment the security of the MFD, your user, your network, and your information, and that can well be met with, uh, with any variety of security software, either on the capture side of things for your scanning needs or on the print management side to make sure that any printed information is shared responsibly and thereby mitigating your risk and your exposure uh, to any possible breaches of information. I hope that answers your question, Cindy. We have two more questions for you here, Mark. There's a question here um, from Stephen saying, what are the additional requirements when dealing with personal health information? Oh, that's an interesting one. And with, with only four minutes to go, I think that's a, it's, a, uh, it's a biggie. I'll just mention a couple. So personal health information is obviously, um, uh, I shouldn't say obvious, so personal health information is both um, covered by, um, by regular privacy legislation, uh, but also there is specific legislation that relates to the treatment of personal health information in Ontario um, and a couple of other provinces. So when dealing with personal health information, not only are there um, the additional uh, or the requirements to to get consent by individuals and uh, to, to, to store the information, but as well, organizations have to undergo certain additional privacy assessments, so a PIA, um, a privacy impact assessment, and, and really have to uh, uh, establish a true management uh, of, that, of that information because, in the end, Healthcare facilities uh, are all about the uh, that personal information of personal health information of its uh, of its patients. So uh, I, I can't really get into it too too deeply. It's very specific to um, to healthcare, but also it's specifically uh, or it's applicable to people who provide services to healthcare. So if you're not a hospital, it doesn't mean that you don't have to think about this. And with, I think we have three minutes to go here. Are there any other questions, uh, Nicole?
okay at this point I'd just like to say thank you very much for um, for joining the webcast today and um, I hope that the uh, I hope the webcast has provided you with some uh, some takeaways and some ideas to uh, to take back to your organizations and to um, and to uh, to potentially revisit or think a little bit more about information security both with print and other network um, endpoints. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mark. Thanks very much. Have a great day, everybody.